Right. So, when I say the words mad scientist or dastardly doctor, any number of felonious physicians, fictional and non, could come to mind. From reanimators of dead tissue, to abomination makers that share a body with their creature, to real-life doctors playing God on nightmare mode, and a host of horrible others. The prize taker for the most famous of these dastardly doctors might realistically be Frankenstein, due to the wildly popular novel and films in which he is featured. But the oldest example of the dastardly doctor trope might realistically be Dr. Faust, a frequently fictionalized historical figure, sometimes called George Faustus, who ran around Germany somewhere between the mid-14th or 1500s, and was either an itinerant astrologer condemned by the church as a heretic, or, uh, Protestant. Whatever, damnation worthy either way, right, says the church. While the definitive Faust is now thought to be the two-volume opus penned by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, the Faustian legend is old enough for Christopher Marlowe to have once taken a crack at it, which would make it a contemporary of works such as Romeo and Juliet, and coincide historically with at least one substantial outbreak of bubonic plague. In case the name Faust is unfamiliar to you, it is an age-old story in which boy meets devil. Devil goes, Bwahaha, I am Mephistopheles, I have come for your soul. Boy goes, meh. And the devil's all like, what do you mean, meh? Aren't you impressed? Boy goes, dude, I am an old-ass plague doctor, and I have seen some shit. Very little impresses me. Hmm, says the devil. I take it you are an unhappy survivor of the plague. Duh. What if I use my substantial power and influence to make you happy? Can I have your soul? Can I, can I, huh? Good luck, says boy, and takes the deal. Devil gives boy a second chance at youth. Boy meets girl. Girl runs away. Boy goes, dibs! and conspires with the devil in order to seduce this girl. Girl finds she is pregnant, while boy goes to some lame party and loses track of time. Girl gets shunned for having a child out of wedlock, and their child dies. Girl gets accused of killing their child and goes to prison. Boy finally looks down at his damn watch and returns to his beloved, only to find she is now disgraced and has gone crazy with grief. Boy tries to rescue girl, but girl cannot accept him as anything other than a delusion of her torment and dies in prison. Boy decides maybe this Mephistopheles character is not the nicest guy. Duh. But unfortunately, he is bound to this devil by contract until further notice. So, Boy misadventures with devil through time and space, leaving a trail of carnage and dead lovers in their wake until Boy is once again old and gray. But in the second to last scene of his biography, Boy meets a different girl who calls herself Care and helps him at long last to get in touch with a thing called human empathy. Devil goes, Aha, you're happy, I win your mind. And Care goes, <laughs> nice try, buddy. But you can't give this depth of happiness because it can only come from someplace good. Whereafter, Care and her homegirls whisk Boy off to heaven, where he gets to spend the rest of eternity, presumably Netflix and chilling with the girl whose life he ruined, the end. Now, before we get into themes and symbolism and junk concerning this particular dastardly doctor, I have a confession to make that might depreciate my nerd cred. I do not love Geta's version of Faust. I love book one and find it to be beautifully written. But at least to me, book two is an endurance exercise that makes me ache for the brevity of the summaries of Faust I heard in the kids' shows of my youth, or the visual interest from F.W. Murnau's Faust from 1926. And if you are at all interested in movie history or practical effects, I cannot recommend Faust from 1926 highly enough. It is available for free right here on YouTube.com, and remains to this day some of the best filmmaking in all of filmmaking. Nevertheless, were I to be as a book report on Goethe's Faust, I would likely start with the obligatory Christ metaphor, which, credit where credit is due, is not as on the nose as it tends to be elsewhere in fiction. No spread eagle poses, no noble sacrifice, and no triumphant resurrection. Instead, what Goethe gives his audience is possibly an imaginative retelling of the temptation of Christ, wherein the devil makes an enticing offer to his Christ figure, swap sides from good to evil, and I will make the world your playground. And this time, Christ takes the deal. So, if ever any readers of the Gospel mused about what they would be tempted to do given the authority over the kingdoms of the Earth, we get to see what such a rampage would look like through Dr. Faust's assorted escapades. Not only does he lay waste to valiant armies and the hearts of beautiful women everywhere for the sheer and utter hell of it, he is perhaps allowed to recap it through the magic of time travel? I assume that's the case, because after his sweetie dies in Book 1, he goes on a fanciful quest to court and marry Helen of Troy then somehow ends up the tragedy-prone father of Icarus, as you do. And in his quest for happiness, he even briefly tries to use the power of Mephistopheles to help people, a thing that is handled differently in the movie, but in a way that I think gets to the heart of the dastardly doctor trope really well. See, when we first meet Dr. Faust in the film, 
He's a practicing doctor, learned teacher, and pillar of his community. So when a mysterious plague starts ravaging his picturesque hometown, his first instinct is to help. Therefore, when Mephistopheles grants him the power to heal the sick, it works beautifully. But once people get the idea that the doctor's power might not necessarily have come from God, they stop trusting him. An apt parallel to the faith versus modern medicine argument that would not be noticeably out of place in discussions about other plagues. Hypothetically, if ever a plague befell humanity in the 21st century, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, cough, cough. Anyway, as you might imagine, Goethe's Faust is a long-ass couple of books. And while his legacy as a dastardly doctor may seem utterly dwarfed by the likes of Doctors Frankenstein or Jekyll, it is not possible to guess without reading Faust just how boundless its influence has been on contemporary storytelling. For instance, you know the gag where a love sick someone pulls petals from the flower going, He loves me. Hmm. He loves me not. Dr. Faust's unfortunate sweetheart, Marguerite by name, might be the first character on written record ever to play that game. Elsewhere in pop culture, Dr. Faust's presence is felt in pretty much any story in which the main character wheels and deals with the devil. And one of my favorite influences that Faust has had on pop culture is as a mirror for the goings-on between Christine and Eric in Phantom of the Opera, according to me from another video. As the opera pertains to Christine, she is more often than not singing selections from The Damnation of Faust, a story in which an innocent girl gets seduced by a questionable character and ends up suffering horribly for it, which makes this portion of the Lloyd Webber stage show slash movie really weird in context. Like, I unabashedly love this song, think of me, but in universe, it's supposed to be a song from Faust, as evidenced by the dreamscape on which Christine stands, flanked by angels, downstage right. And it can't be a metaphor, as though these are not the literal words, but merely something that Christine is feeling, because Carlotta was totally gonna sing this a minute ago. See, based on what little we know of Marguerite, when she is dead, if she sings to Faust, the words of her song should be less, Think of me, more like, I'm okay, my soul is beyond this, or, Kiss my ass, you self-centered bastard. For my money, the character of Marguerite really is what makes book one of Faust a pathos-filled masterpiece, while her absence for the duration makes book two an uphill slog from start to finish. See, Marguerite is a tragic figure whose joy, innocence, and entire family was destroyed by, as far as she knew, a careless playboy and his creepy friend. She died young and needlessly to a society who hated her for bearing a child out of wedlock then hated her for maybe expediting her child's trip to heaven. She's kind of delirious when we catch up to her in prison, and she reports to Faust. But let me suckle first, my baby. I blissed it all this livelong night. They took to a, to vex me, maybe. And now they say I killed the child outright, and never shall I be glad again. And perhaps the worst part is that Marguerite was born to be a mother. She is great with kids. She is full of love and compassion for absolutely everybody, with the possible exception of Mephistopheles. She may be innocent, but she's not stupid. Meanwhile, in self-centered bastard land, it is interesting to note that Faust, as much as he can love anyone, genuinely does love Marguerite. And also, at no point does he equate said love with happiness, nor does Mephistopheles try to bullshit him into thinking he is happy just because he happens to be in love. This would be consistent with pre-Hollywood notions held by some that love is a disease and once you catch it, you are useless. But it is so wildly different from the customary narratives we tend to tell and get told these days as to be a standout feature in the story of Dr. Faust. Now, as I mentioned, Goethe's version of Faust is not my favorite. But at this point in talking through my thoughts on the subject, I would only be midway through BSing my book report. And if I didn't want my grade to suffer, I would need to be careful how I said Goethe's Faust is not my favorite and how I backed it up because teachers get touchy when students say nasty things about the moldy oldies of literature and it turns into a whole thing. Fortunately, I believe I have a thematically appropriate way to explain why I struggle with this particular text and why I begrudgingly see its overall value. Because what bothers me about Goethe's Faust is astonishingly similar to what bothers me about that first great Frankenstein from 1931. Both stories revolve around a privileged, bored doctor who messes with the strictures of mortal boundaries for no good reason beyond his personal amusement. Both have the nerve to act surprised when there are consequences to their choices. Both may regret the part that they played in the suffering of others, but the worst that actually happens to them is they are made to watch some of it. And at the bitter end of their stories, their tormentors fall to their deaths, allowing these dastardly doctors to spend the rest of their foreseeable existence in the arms of the gorgeous women whose lives they destroyed. But with Frankenstein of 1931, a case could be made that the movie makers merely fouled up the ending of a good book, 
in making an effort to protect the innocent and punish the guilty without actually understanding which was which. In the case of Dr. Faust, what I find narratively unsatisfying is likely something that Goethe's largely Catholic audience would have loved about it. Because the character of Care is giving Faust unmerited compassion on behalf of the Almighty and showing him what a sincere Christian might call grace. Supposedly, grace is the stuff that lets our dear ones clearly see our many faults and love us anyway. It's the stuff that led to all those yummy Christ metaphors for which book and movie makers have been insatiable for the last two millennia. And it is what allows self-centered bastards to behave unconstantly for two lifetimes worth of dirty deeds, then repent in the last couple of scenes of their epic and go to heaven. It's not cathartic. It's not fair. And deep down in our justice-starved hearts, I think most of us want the bad guys to be punished at the end of their stories. But what we should want for Dr. Faust is grace. Because grace is a thing that we might want at some point in our stories. So to sum up, the dastardly doctor trope might not be as old as the bubonic plague, but it is definitely older than Christopher Marlowe or William Shakespeare. And our long-standing tradition of incorporating it as a trope into our stories is likely rooted in our collective anxieties about whether or not we can trust the various doctors in our lives. But unlike other dastardly doctor narratives wherein the punishment often fits the many, many crimes, Geta presents Dr. Faust as a miserable man filled with regret at the end of his life, and chooses to forgive him. That is not the call I would have made were I Dr. Faust's author, sweetheart, or patient. And it offends my sense of justice that after doing measurable harm to possibly thousands of people, he's allowed to enjoy the same heaven as Marguerite. Yet I can absolutely see the benefit of practicing forgiveness on fictional characters, and perhaps applying what we learn to IRL people that hurt us. Especially since at some point in our lives, we will likely hurt an IRL person and find ourselves in similar need of grace. Or if personal growth is not your jam and you'd rather see some good old-fashioned comeuppance, feel free to bypass Get This Faust and go straight to the opera, also known as the Damnation of Faust. That works too. As always, thank you for giving these videos a shot, like, and subscribe if you feel like it. Also, don't sell your soul to the YouTube devil in exchange for views. It doesn't help. Until next time, take it easy. Love you. Bye.